I said, empty your mind. Be formless, shapeless, like water. It's about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. Join movement expert Aaron Alexander as he dives into the minds of the foremost innovative healthcare thinkers and movement masters on their approach to optimal health and wellness. Align Podcast. Welcome back to Align Podcast. My name is Aaron Alexander. In today's phenomenal episode, I got to have one of my preferred thinkers walking around this globe, Dr. Dan Ang. Dan is a medical doctor, uh, board certified in psychiatry and neurology. Um, he is one of the Onnit pros, so he works over at uh, Onnit in Austin, Texas, and he's just a badass. He's, he's a tremendous thinker. He his life experience is that of like ten normal in quotation, human beings. Um, he's lived out in the desert, lived out in the jungle in South America, lived in the mountains, and um, he's going deep <laughs> into a lot of different wormholes. So we get into some of those wormholes in this conversation. So we get into psychiatry, we get into plant medicines, we get into just how to optimize this human situation that we're all taking part in here. Uh, here is a little clip. Like we get to choose what program makes the most sense to us. And so if here's a buffet of options, the, the opportunity is to choose consciously. Thank you so much for tuning in to the website, aligntherapy.com, A-L-I-G-N therapy.com. If you feel called to that little mofo, you will find the show notes for this and the rest of the episodes, and you can start the five-day movement challenge, integrating optimal movement function into every flipping thing you do in your day-to-day. Um, I got a quote. This quote comes out of the book, The Prophet. And uh, we talk about this book a little bit in the conversation. I say I'm going to quote something else in the conversation, and I couldn't find that quote. So I'm going to quote something else. Here we go. Uh, And the weaver said, speak to us of clothes. And he answered, your clothes conceal much of your beauty, yet they hide not the unbeautiful. And though you seek in garments the freedom of privacy, you may find in them a harness and a chain. Would that you could meet the sun and the wind with more of your skin and less of your raiment. Raiment's an old classical term for clothing. Um, for the breath of life is in the sunlight and the hand of life is in the wind. Plow, Prophet. I'm sure most of you guys probably read that book already, but read The Prophet by, by Khalil Gibran. Pretty big deal. Uh, thank you guys so much for leaving reviews on iTunes. If we read your review, we'll send you out some stuff from Organifi. If you buy crap from Organifi, Organifi.com, really good supplements, uh, protein powder, stuff like that. Use the align code, A-L-I-G-N, you get 20% off. Uh, this comes from Rhino Mind, be a line, exclamation point. The Align Podcast without fail maintains a high level of interest, no, wait, a level of high interest, variety, practicality that is unparalleled by any other podcast. Aaron Alexander intuitively knows how to create a fun, informative, and philosophical sound podcast that is so conscious of bias and dogma that its information throws through my neurons with the purity and innocence of a newborn child. Rhino, go on poetic and deep on that. He goes into some more stuff too. So thank you so much. For that, hit us up at Align Podcast on Instagram, and we will send you out some Organifi stuff. It'd be great. Um, I think that's good. I'm headed to PaleoFX in the end of this month. Uh, this month is April. If you guys want to buy tickets and come check that thing out, they're on the podcast page. So you can do that. I'll be teaching some movement stuff there, and uh, it's going to be great. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Here we go. Back to the show with the good doctor, Dan Angle. Align Podcast. We're just sitting here, you know, eating CBD, honey, and drinking mushroom tea. <laughs> Just general, yeah. I, I I say profound bullshit is kind of like the that's like the intention of the podcast, if there is an intention. I'm trying to be as intentionless as, as zen about it as possible, <laughs> without being excessively and intentioned without being intentional. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thanks for coming over, man. Definitely appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Good to get to know you. Build the brotherhood. See what we want to do together. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. What's your uh, so What's your intention with going out to Boulder? What's happening with that? So Boulder, the mountains just have such a sweet spot in my heart and soul. Yeah. That was where I had my big uh, individuation, beginning of an awakening, so to speak. Moved out of my home environment where I'd been for twenty four years. 
and a whole new identity. And it was funny when I moved from Texas to Colorado, from Austin, San Antonio to Denver to start my medical residency is when I could really feel a new identity coming online, Mm. shifted my name from Daniel to Dan. Now I was like an official doctor because I graduated medical school. But as a, as a resident, particularly an intern, you don't know shit. You have a medical degree and they call you doctor, but you're like the bottom end of the totem pole and doing all the grunt work. That's a wise way to go. Daniel to Dan, instead of like Daniel to like spirit feather or something. (laughs) Well, that, that came, that came later (laughs) in Sedona. Figured it's coming. (laughs) Not quite spirit feather. Uh, yeah, I've lived in a lot of different places and in each of the places that we live, it, it has its own identity. It has its own flavor on the grid. Hawaii is a particular expression. Sedona is a particular expression. The mountains in Colorado Boulder, that Denver front range summit County area is a particular expression. Hmm. The jungle is a particular expression. So they all bring out different aspects of us and who we choose to be in that arena and the, in the communities that we come into contact with and. And so Colorado was, was this even more of like an adventure spirit, but that wasn't contained or confined to any particular piece of identity, well, less so to particular identification roles that I had grown up with as a really aggressive, super strong athlete in a variety of different combat sports and a gunner across the board, mm. 4.0, captain of the team, dating the prom queen. I mean, like, you know, whatever the things are. Like checking off all like second place sucks. I'll fucking cut you from the team if you're even whining or getting us close to, you know, less than the championship. That level of intensity was really driving it until I broke my neck two weeks before medical school in this really blessed orchestrated dive off a pier into knee high water like this with my hands behind my neck. And I would never even dove into a swimming pool like that. Hmm. And so first thing to hit was my crown. And compression fracture C5 ended up in a halo for three months, the first three months of med school. And it was one of those things that first it finally slowed me down. And I was like, wow, I've been really living an intense gig. <laughs> yeah. Why? Who am I trying to impress? Who am I trying to get validation from? What's the, what's the thing that's driving this level of intensity? It's really turned me into kind of an asshole but really good on paper and able to check off all the boxes and ace your test if I see it as just another challenge. And instead of going into surgery or emergency medicine, which was like that kind of gunner mentality, not to say that's bad at all, but that's just how I was driven. I realized once I slowed down, it's like, you know, I'm living other people's expectations of me. And I haven't really even gotten a sense of what I expect of myself and what I would love to experience in my own life. Hmm. And through that contemplation and going through all of the different clinical rotations that med school training will take you through, I realized I didn't really like surgery because I didn't like the intense environment anymore. It just, it was completely not my chosen level of identification. ER medicine was cool, but I could not tolerate the change in sleep schedules i mean i was a freaking zombie i actually got diagnosed with narcolepsy in med school because of the change in my um sleep habits through call schedules the narcolepsy expressed itself which is like drop attacks when you sleep in places you're not supposed to sleep like driving i don't fall asleep driving all the time after call you did this happen yeah totally (laughs) so i stopped driving was driving was it ever bad that sounds like it you know blew out my tires a couple of times driving off the highway between uh where i went to college and where i went to med school i would stop driving in college for a while because i was like because that happened but i didn't know why it happened i just thought i was burning a candle at both ends which i was doing but i figured it out in med school when it expressed itself from the call schedule change of sleep cycles and um, i did a multi-sleep latency test I was doing a neurology rotation at the time and all my professors were like, wow, you got textbook narcolepsy. Hmm. So they put me on Ritalin or a cousin of Ritalin called Silert. And that shit works. <laughs> there's a reason there's a lot of people addicted to stimulants because they freaking work. And I was like, oh my gosh, for the first time ever, my brain feels like it's really online. 
And with people who have narcolepsy, you kind of need that unless there's something driving the hypersomnolence. And for me, it was a lot of adrenal fatigue and that level of intensity and not getting enough sleep and eating shit food and smoking way too much pot and drinking way too much alcohol. Pot was probably a minor one. Alcohol was even major. So I got totally sober, changed up my diet, got more sleep and regimented that, and then narcolepsy essentially went away. So eventually I was able to stop the meds. But Hmm. through that whole experience with med school, I realized, you know, I think slowing down and not having to make A's and being a gunner and kind of letting off the gas pedal a little bit, being cool with B's, yeah. Smoking a lot of pot, getting, you know, starting to listen to Pink Floyd and like really expanding my consciousness. I ended up having more fun in med school and college than I ever had in, I mean, med school and residency than I ever had in high school and college. Because high school and college, I was so fucking intense. Hmm. Med school and residency, things just kind of like let up a little bit and it started having a lot more fun and just getting to know who I was. And that, that happened even further when I moved away from Texas after med school to residency in Denver. And then in the mountains and starting to climb and snowboard and like really just like my f- soul felt like it really came into its next expression. So I have a sweet spot in my heart for the mountains and it's going to be good to, to get back. Yeah. You're familiar with Paul Selig, I know, because Aubrey's all hot and bothered about him and, and for good reason. Dude's amazing. <laughs> um, I've been listening to his book, Mastery, or I think it's Book of Mastery. Book of Mastery. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, one of the things I got out of there, which I highly recommend people jumping on and grabbing that, I'm doing the audiobook version, um, but was, you're speaking about expectations, and I think so many of us, we live in expectation, we don't actually even realize whose expectations they are, you know, and one of the analogies that he used in there is death is like taking off a tight shoe. And since then, I've been like, okay, how do I sort this death thing out while I'm still here? Because <laughs> <You know? laughs> once you have that realization of like, yeah, I'm wearing a fucking tight shoe like all the time, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, you kind of pull the laces back a little bit and you're like, oh, okay, cool. I feel, oh, whoa, how much can I pull these laces back? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, wait, maybe these laces actually serve me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, what's the balance mm-hmm. of the shoe fitting, yeah. you know, to create support, but also not like choking me out? Totally. Yeah, the ego is essentially like the lace controller. <laughs> you know how tight how tight do you make that knot, and what kind of knot do you make, and or is it Velcro, or now it's got these little expanded kind of like flexi tabs because I don't have to be so bound. Right. It's a cool analogy because you know sometimes we're wearing office shoes and you know like boardroom style, or sometimes we're wearing soccer cleats, and sometimes we're going barefoot out in the sand, and we're completely unbound, like in the mystical states. And sometimes we're a cowboy boot and, you know, because we inherited that from our dad or our granddad, you know, I mean, there's all these kind of like ways that we identify that shoe foot relationship and realize that we have the opportunity to control how tight we feel bound, but we can only get that perspective when we've stepped outside of it. So mm. like when Morpheus asks Neo, are you ready for the, the red, are you sure you're ready to wake up? Are you sure you're ready for the red pill? Because Waking up is typically not an easy process. Yeah. And it's interesting how some of the, the, like the locations that we end up, like I went to Boulder back to, I lived in, I mentioned to you, I I lived in Boulder off and on for about five years. And upon going back there, I looked into the mountains and I saw the mountains for what they actually, what I perceive now to truly have been, you know, which is this, this test of me on a daily basis, challenge myself, Mm. you know, and facing fears. And I still haven't completely faced them. I still am noticing little like fears pop up in myself Mm. specifically around, uh, death. Mm. You know, it's not like this huge thing, but I just see there's still a little, little seed in there. So I'm like, Oh shit. Okay. More, there's more, (laughs) but to me, those mountains, that was kind of, I'm pretty sure that's what that was, was just this like early twenties, challenging myself. I thought I just wanted to get good at rock climbing, but in reality it was this, it was this medicine, you know, this daily basis of feeling like, okay, like I think maybe I'm I'm on the edge, I'm on the edge, I'm on, you know, proving my ego or proving whatever it may have been. Mm -hmm. But the medicine isn't always as as apparent as what we think when we get like the penicillin, Mm -hmm. like it's on the label, there's what it is. Sometimes like this life medicine is a little bit more abstract. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Have you gotten anything from like, have you seen, I mean, so you spent quite a bit of time in Peru. Mm Mm-hmm. What was that like? Amazing. <laughs> Heaven and hell. <laughs> All of it. Literally and beautifully. 
Um, so <clears throat> through my medical training, I realized, okay, surgery and ER medicines, that kind of like intensity is not me. Psychiatry seems like a good fit. I realize I'm interested in the mind and what makes us who we are <laughs> and how you can have two people raised in the same household and be completely different. Right? I mean, souls come in with a u completely unique constitution. Hmm. And we are all as individuals and unique as snowflakes. And it's still mind-boggling to me that no snowflake is the same. Like, staggering. And of course, no, no two people are the same. And how is it that we're all different and what makes us who we are? And how, how did we get to a place of self-identification that's continuing to unfold into this recognition that we're all we're everything and nothing all at the same time mm. and after i graduated all my medical training i realized i don't like the way psychiatry is practiced because i don't like and i also did child psychiatry because i wanted to work with kids <clears throat> but i really didn't like the way child psychiatry is practiced because we give kids adult medications without the understanding of neurodevelopmental ramifications like how is this going to alter this little being psyche developing through a really formative time frame with medications that we're not really sure because all we have are medications and we don't this is 20 years ago and it's gotten marginally better now looking at like functional medicine issues and nutrigenomics and toxigenomics like what's the gene pattern and related to epigenetics and environmental factors that express certain parts of the genes and when people are genetically limited in their ability to detox certain chemicals and v vaccine residues and organophosphates, et cetera, then those can build up in the system and have neurologic implications that, that express themselves symptom symptomatically like autism, blah, 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 anxiety, blah, blah, blah. Oppositional defiant disorders are like one of my favorite. Like, okay, kids are supposed to be oppositional. They're finding out who they fucking are. Right. We're not supposed to medicate that. If it gets expressed in a, in a way that's violent, okay, then there's cause for concern. And usually that's when they come to see a child psychiatrist and they say, okay, you get, you get this medication. And so that it wasn't a good fit. And so I opened up a clinic in Portland for about three years on in integrative psychiatry, helping people, kids and adults come off of medications onto more natural protocols. And it was good. We were doing good, good work, but it, it wasn't quite the, the level of fulfillment for me. It wasn't the whole picture. It was just like, you know, maybe a quarter of the pie. Yeah. <clears throat> and I was introduced to ayahuasca. And after that, the whole freaking... The rest of the pie started to reveal itself. <laughs> I was like, holy nope. shit. Everything I thought I knew about the mind and everything I th thought I was learning in psychiatry looks like feels like kindergarten in comparison. Yeah. So I fairly quickly uh, closed up my practice, moved out of Portland, lived in an ashram for a couple of years before I was ready to go down to the jungle and live there for a little over a year to study with the medicine keepers, the men and women there. And it was beautiful. It was powerful. No running water, no electricity, no gringos. It was just like me and my teacher in a couple of huts. And How long were you out there? Uh, I did two different stints in a little over a year total. I came home in kind of the middle because I got, um, I was doing a bit too much medicine. Like we were talking earlier about, you know, that we get curious about the further, the, the, the edge of the known, jumping off, having an experience and coming back and... Uh, being able to share the story. Um, and so there's a, there's already that kind of adventure inclination. But there was also a deep connection I had to the medicines. And so I was dieting a couple of medicines that were pretty strong. And um, Which ones? This particular one was Chitik Sanango. The one that I had uh, wrapped up was uh, Pinon Blanco. And then went to another place and was dieting Chitik Sanango. So Pinon Blanco is more of a power-based medicine. Chitik Sanango is more of a heart-based medicine. And um, and as it was moving through my system, and I, I felt like a just a fountainhead for the source code. And I was downloading for three weeks this entire compendium of what I knew at that time. This was about 10 years ago on integrative medicine integrative psychiatry, holistic living, what now I, what now I consider soul centered medicine. And it was phenomenal. Mm. I've never had such an experience of awakening and such an experience of angelic information, cosmic energy, and 
and universal intelligence, wisdom moving through. So I'd stay up all night journaling, downloading, all day long jungle runs, barefoot deep into the forest, and then all evening more ceremony. Oh. And I was just doing that over and over and over for three weeks until you know, you, my teacher had, one of my teachers had told me before I went down to the jungle, he said, you be careful with those medicines um, because you have to build the vessel to be able to hold that much energy. Okay. He could already see, he was pretty awake and he could already sense what was probably in, in store. And I didn't know what he meant by that. Um, but I knew I needed to go down and I knew I needed to study. And sure enough, I had not built my vessel to be able to hold that much charge. So it's essentially, you know, sending uh, too much charge through a circuit and the fuse blows and my fuse blew. And that looked like mania that dysregulated and weakened my immune system. And in the midst of, um, trying to ground the energy I left in the middle of my dieta, which was not a good idea because you're just walking around, you haven't sealed it and you're like just so open and, um, went down to Honduras to learn to scuba dive. Cause I, I just wanted to grow. I knew I needed to get in water for a long time. I was like, the best way I know how to do that is learn how to scuba dive and stay under for a long time. So I went to Honduras, started to learn how to scuba dive. I got these sand fly bites and my immune system was so weak. I got septic. And I was so against allopathic medicine that I wouldn't take antibiotics. So that just got worse and worse. And I was trying to find all these natural remedies. And finally, I came back to the States. I just completely wrecked. My mom was like, holy shit, what happened to you? <laughs> Come in. <laughs> Don't move. Sit down. And um, finally, I came across colloidal silver. And that um, internally and externally got a hold of the infection. And, um, after about a month of healing, just my, you know, legs were all swollen up and pus coming up everywhere. And just this like crazy internal sepsis, um, was finally strong enough to go back and finish the dieta, restart it, open it, finish it. And then I stayed for another four to six months or so and did th th three or four more dietas. And that's when you drop in and you learn from the teacher plants themselves just directly and in, in isolation usually and um and i didn't really plan on coming back it made the most sense of anything that i had ever studied traditional medicines done with intention that open up our consciousness towards our purpose to know who like paul selig says to know who we are to know what we are to know how we serve yep and that was all getting clarified so i was like i'm good no reason no, re no reason no need to go home yeah and eventually, um, it was clear that if I was going to be my best service, it probably wasn't going to be hanging out in the hut, you know, for the rest of my life. Yeah. So I've, that was a long journey home. Yeah. I found that with like, from a, like a physical therapy perspective or a movement perspective, so often we'll end up attaching, being, identifying with these, you know, say like a rotator cuff exercise, you know, you got to get the medial rotation, external rotation, abduction, adduction to go through all the ranges of motions. And you have this idea that you're stuck on of what's going to heal the shoulder. Mm. And then all of a sudden you have some type of experience that you get out of the way of yourself for a second to allow kind of like the, the, the deeper truth to come through. Mm. You know, but generally speaking, we're just, we're so loud with what we think we're supposed to do. We don't ever allow any of the whispery stuff to actually come in. And like, that's where that's, that's where the real wisdom is at. But our day is occupied by noise. You know, so getting to that point where it's like, oh, just let the whisper speak into the shoulder, maybe. Mm. And maybe you'll start, maybe you'll be moved to do something that will actually mm. unlock that, that seed of what's causing the instability in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. And is that is the physical expression of that shoulder impingement and balance, weakness, trauma, injury, is that how much of that expression is physical right. versus mental, emotional, spiritual, psychic, karmic, environmental. There's so many different layers and, and hanging out in the jungle and doing deep work with those realms. We really get the sense of the whole buffet of influence in this in in our minds and our bodies and our hearts and our relationships mm. and it was a completely new 
operating system to orient to and, and really beautiful. And it's, it's a particular expression of medicine, particularly the style of Shipibo work and Mestizo work. And, and there's a lot of way, I mean, another t teacher of mine was fond of saying there's a lot of ways up to the mountain. Yeah. And yet there's still only one top of the mountain. Yeah. You know, there's still one source, the sense of oneness, a sense of unity that we're all moving back to. And there's a lot of ways to get up that. I feel like the climb. idea of, of building the vessel in order to be able to, to sustain the charge or hold the, hold the, the contents. Like, what does that look like? How mm -hmm. do we, how do we, how do we actually build the vessel? Mm -hmm. A great question. Yeah. Um, again, I, I think of it like on, on different levels, you know, if we're talking about body, mind, heart, soul, and which aspects of those are we building? to hold which levels of experience we're desiring. So if you and I were both rehabbing a shoulder impingement and we were using like the ARP wave direct current stimulation, you, your body, because you're built like a tank and I'm built like a Ferrari, <laughs> you can handle more torque. You can handle more charge just physically moving through your system. So you would be able to hold more of an amperage on that arp wave machine than my body would be able to to experience yep. and it's similar on a heart level on a mind level and on our soul level we have different levels of ability to be able to express levels of resistance and resilience and mastery and the pace of our maturing uh, because we're all coming in with a very unique constitution, with a very unique pre-birth imprint, which we could call soul, which we could call genetic um, transgenerational imprinting. Because right? trauma gets passed on in the generations just as much as hair color and eye color do. <laughs> Yeah, that's shown with, with rats. Totally. Yeah. Right. The it's... trauma of, was a, you're probably familiar with the thing, but they, they before they, they would shock these rats, they would give them this really strong smell. I don't remember the, what it was called, so what the chemical was. But then they found the same thing ended up with the, with the children of the, the, of, the, of the mother and the father. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have that smell, and they go, oh, all, right. their, all their sphincters clench up. Like, it's coming. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> totally. And the compliment is true too. Learning is passed on generationally. So they've done similar. I think this was from Rupert Sheldrake's. Yeah, he does a lot of good stuff. Ted morphic, talk morphic on resonance. The, on the morphic field. Yeah. And he was speaking about um, the studies in Matt's learning r mazes. Yeah. And the speed at which they're able to complete uh, a known maze and then a new maze. And things that are accelerating their learning and their progeny or kids without learning or being trained perform better in those maze tests than the rats from parents that didn't have that training. Yeah. So, and same with bird songs. Same with discoveries. Same with, you right. know, discovering the DNA, double helix, and electricity, yeah. and all these things. I don't know about electricity, but there's look into various different inventions. It's like, it's within like days or weeks or hours that this stuff right. is discovered. Right, on the, field, <laughs> on the other side of the earth. aren't even in touch with <laughs> really. The morphic field is a real thing. Yeah. And when we're coming in, we have all this imprinting. In each of those levels, body, mind, heart, soul. And so when we're developing ourselves and we're choosing to build the vessel to be ready to take the next evolutionary leap, we get what we ask for. And that's why the, the adage, be careful what you wish for, is true. <laughs> and the, the, my experience in that, particularly as it related to the journey in medicine work was I had come out of a divorce when I transitioned from Portland and I couldn't feel the sadness and I knew it was there. Right. And I'm enough of a 
personal development geek and focus junkie that I I continue to look for and pursue my growth edge. And that has been um, at times very joyful and at times very <laughs> horrendous because we don't know what it means to fully actualize a prayer if the prayer is something like, please help me open up my heart so I can feel this sadness so that I can be fully experienced and expressed and hold as a human. Please help me open up my heart. If the prayer is that simple and it sounds beautiful, sure, let me feel more love. That also means that I'm going to be invited, sometimes kicking and screaming, into all of the experiences that closed my heart off in the first place. And that can feel like a re-traumatization, particularly if, you, if, if I don't have support and I don't understand what's happening and I don't have a mirror to help me validate the process and actually understand that this is midwifing me through that journey in order to actualize that prayer that I can be whole, happy, well, and free. And so there was a 10-year process that's still actually happening. I'm still finding layers deeper and more expression in a, in a compassionate, loving way yeah. in my partnership, in my community, in my self, right? So that's all still happening at times. It's just been like, what the fuck was, <laughs> this wasn't in the fine print. I didn't yeah. sign up for this, you know, fuck you. Who, who said that this was the thing that I, cause all my ego attachment had been totally different to what that process was going to look like. Some fantasy about what going down to the jungle was going to be like some fantasy about what it is to be like, you know, shaman doctor, or whatever the, my ego was just trying to like identify as because it was trying to get validation, gratification, a sense of importance, a sense of, you know, whatever, but actually it was mostly all of the compliment of that, getting my ass kicked, not knowing who I was spending a year in a suicidal depression in a tent after I moved back from the jungle because I couldn't relate to anything. Where was the tent? In Sedona. Okay. Cause that was the only place I knew that I had friends that had enough land and I could just be on the backside of their property for however long it needed to be. And is, that where, were... is that where Aubrey shoveled you up? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> totally. <laughs> <laughs> that's good man yeah is there any imprint of some of this kind of more like meta potentially to some nebulous trauma that we experience in our in our in our lives in your neurology is there any type of like in relation to say like a concussion for example mm. we'll see these functional changes happening in the brain is there any kind of is that always happening in tandem if we have some type of say a heart trauma with a relationship or a death or something like that does that end up manifesting in the in the mind yeah is there some way that we can tangibly see that or does it have to stay in kind of like self development conversation where we just kind of talk it out yeah this is where it's getting really interesting around the entire field of biometrics and the quantified self and being able to track quantitatively what's happening in the heart and the mind as we go through some kind of process. It could be more of a personal development process. It could be a physical healing process. It could be a healing from concussion kind of process. All of those things are going to have a heart, mind, body, soul connection. Gabor Mate's fond of saying you can't separate the mind from the body, nor can you separate the individual from the environment. I think he's totally accurate with that. So it's, there's yeah. always each of those levels playing and if we're going through a heart healing, that can look like post-traumatic stress disorder healing and recovery work, trauma recovery work. There's a variety of different ways to do that, one of which is becoming more and more appreciated now, which is psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. MDMA is going into phase three trials yeah. for this work because there's nothing else that we know that's as effective, 83% cure rate not improvement rate, cure rate for chronic severe PTSD after two to three sessions. It's mind boggling. Yep. Anything close to that is like cognitive behavioral therapy and, and pharmaceutical medication at like maybe 20 to 30%. So when that process is happening, when the trauma recovery work is happening, you, we will see changes in the 
EEG and the brainwave patterns, we will see different neuropeptides and cardiopeptides released because a heart is a gland as much as it is a pump. In some capacity, it's even more of one. HeartMath Institute has really helped us come online with the awareness of things like heart rate variability. It's yeah. fairly easy to track that and see that, right? So we've got apps now, little earbuds and finger little nodes that can tell us what our heart rate variability is and be able to track heart rate variability patterns that are more connected to states of relaxation versus states of stress. So states of sympathetic dominance or parasympathetic dominance because the nervous system is essentially binary. We're either in stress, fight or flight, or we're in rest and recuperation. We're not, we can't be dominant in both at the same time. So we kind of, you know, we just seesaw between these two and we need them both. So you know, stress is, stress is good. Actually stress is like a resistance training, Yeah. but we also have to have the rest and recuperation on the other side. So when we go through these processes, we're getting more and more sophisticated and being able to use wearable devices and, and bio tracking and cognitive tracking devices that show what's actually happening quantitatively. The benefit is that that gives us and our minds, the orientation towards progress because we always want to make sure we want to know where we are and where we're going and to know ideally the next steps to continue to make that progression. Mm. So where am I starting from? So, you know, lab draws, QEEG, EEG draws, biome. So looking at my stool, looking at my microbiome, because that's actually considerably important for even my emotional state and cognitive state. Looking at my inflammatory markers, hormones, like the whole gig. Starting point, where do I want to go? What are my targets? Oftentimes when people come into allopathic medicine, the big entry point is some kind of crisis. So they're going to go see their doctor, not because things are well, but because they're feeling unwell or sick or ill in some kind of capacity. So I want, help me with this pain, depression, anxiety, blood pressure, irritable bowel syndrome, whatever the thing is. So my goal might be resolution of that, but that's still a disease oriented model. That's still an allopathic model versus a health oriented model or a transcendence model, which has helped me f find more ways that I can feel empowered, lovingly connected to who I am and what I'm here to do, clear on what my passion and purpose is, um, integrated into a community of like-minded, like-hearted brothers and sisters that help me up level my human experience and I can help them do the same. So I come into a greater state of soul level fulfillment, which is what I consider as transcendent medicine. So that my soul, like in a deep level, deeper than my mind and deeper than my heart is reaching further and further states of continued senses of fulfillment. And that means, yes, I'm able to go through the trauma work and I'm, I'm able to work through all of my barriers and limits and perceived programs of loneliness and being not enoughness and being a, not being able to trust anybody or like whatever that is the but tight shoe yeah yeah like i'm able to to recognize that i've been in this tight shoe yep. and i have ways now to know how to loosen those laces and and recognize that i'm in control of that i'm the one that is holding the laces tight I may have been born into a tight shoe, but it's also my tight shoe. And the resolution and the acceleration going from a disease-oriented model to a health-oriented model to a fulfillment-oriented model is greater states of personal responsibility. To know that this is my life to choose, to anchor, to engage, and to recognize that everything is happening with me and not to me. And it can often take the removal of that environmental imprint if that environmental imprint was more towards victimhood. Yeah. And that, that's why a lot of the teachers speak of the spiritual path as a lonely path. 
because we leave those imprints and many of those relationships either on hold or we leave them behind while we're consciously engaging in the new operating system and finding the tribe, our chosen tribe of brothers and sisters that are going to mirror our greatest sense of self. Yeah. And, and, and the person that we are being um, lovingly validated for who we are, not necessarily what we can do or what we contribute, but for who we are and who also we get a sense of we, we can become. I, I see you, like, particularly like if I get to know you and I can tell you're having a, a shit day or you're in a phase of your life where you're just like going through a really dark night of the soul or whatever it is. Like, I can, I can be with you and I can see your beauty and, and, and mirror that for you. And I can also get a sense that this is a process that is developing you into the butterfly going through the chrysalis. So I can, I can appreciate you as, as a butterfly. I can appreciate you in the cocoon. I can appreciate you, uh, you know, as the caterpillar going through that process. And, and when we get a sense of being held in relationship like that, loved and connected to, and we're, and we're open enough and vulnerable enough to really allow that love in. Cause sometimes if I just speak for myself, I have not trusted that right. up till relatively recently. I was not aware that I trusted the medicines and the plants more than I trusted people. And that's why it was so easy for me to say, oh, wow, I'm in the jungle. I'm doing this amazing work in the level of connection and intimacy. I'm home. Well, I'm not born as a plant. I'm not born in even a jungle culture. Mm. You know, so it's not my, like, that wasn't like my destiny or dharma to stay there. It did a, a whole lot for helping me resolve a lot of trauma and be ready to open up my heart. And then the relationship I'm currently in now with my beloved it has been the greatest next evolution of my intimacy and getting to know who I am and the, and the recognition that I was still walled off in many ways. It was okay for me to trust non-humans, but once it was like, it really came down to like, can I trust this woman? Can I trust anybody to, to let be let into those really vulnerable places and being mirrored in that way helped me understand how much, had been done and worked through and how much had not yet been done and worked through. And, and those are the kind of relationships that we would love to see and love to be engaged with. And that feels like such a deep level of fulfillment and a coming home. And sex at dawn was kind of like one of those books for me. And for a lot of people in our kind of like, you know, discussion network, so to speak, about like the, the way that we can live as a community and as a tribe where we are celebrating each other's freedom. We were talking about freedom and yeah. And Khalil Gibran's the prophet. I'll read the, I'll read the freedom thing in the intro here. Hopefully I shouldn't have said that now. I'm probably going to forget. And people are like, what, where's the freedom thing? What the fr <laughs> Just a little carrot <laughs> for part two. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Wanted to take a quick break and thank our sponsor, Organifi, for supporting the show. Organifi is a rad company. I utilize their superfood blends on a daily basis. Um, holding in my hands the green juice right now, filled with all the green powders your little heart could desire, from uh, wheatgrass to spirulina to chlorella to matcha. Really excellent stuff. Highly recommend checking them out. They also do protein blends that are vegan, as far as I can see. So the protein they're using in here is pea protein, quinoa protein, and pumpkin seed protein. Everything's organic. Everything's delicious. Highly recommend checking them out. So go Organifi, O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com and utilize the Align code for 20% off. Organifi.com, Align code, A-L-I-G-N, 20% off. Get that stuff. Thank you guys so much for tuning in back to the show. Pow. I feel like I've, I've kind of pondered on this idea of the, the, the purgatory that one goes through upon leaving an old shell and, and kind of journeying out into another shell, you know? And so I, I had a, a, an experience with, uh, it was actually an ayahuasca experience and it was someone else's story the next day. I kind of had this like processing, everyone's going around talking about their experience and, this girl, she had dealt with all sorts of stuff, drugs and depression, like really dark place. Pretty fascinating to go into such a, a deep place with yourself right beside 
someone like that mm -hmm. and someone like the next person, the next person, the next person, really very interesting soup. Um, but one of the things that she, she had mentioned was, uh, she felt as though these dark paintings that she had in her house were kind of like uh, perpetuating these thoughts. And it was kind of like this realization, like, yeah, you are your fucking environment. You know, Gabor was onto something slash, you know, all the other smart folks that have mentioned things like that, you know, but to, in order to leave your previous environment, there's generally speaking, there's going to be this purgatory phase. It's really uncomfortable, you know? So if you leave your friend group, you might go for a while with no friends. <laughs> right. And, and what's that going to be like? What's that going to be like? Uh -huh. <laughs> How do I get to engage loneliness now? Yeah. And the craving for other yeah. the distraction that will come in when it's hard for me to sit by myself alone and be with my shit. Hmm. Yeah. So that's kind of like, that's a, uh, that's a process to be respected as opposed to something to be diverted from. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh. And, and we don't encourage that in our culture at all. Our culture is so production oriented. Totally. It's so filled with reminders of what the mother culture, like in Ishmael speaking about the mother culture program with our mother culture says is successful or what needs to happen. And depression is inconvenient <laughs> and being uncomfortable is inconvenient. And yeah, it's so fucking juicy to be able to sit with our discomfort and, and look at that. And, and I love the analogy too, of leaving one shell and moving to another. It makes me think of like a little hermit crab. Yeah. You're naked for a bit. Yeah. And, and now open to what? Yeah. Yeah. Like what's the program? I'm, I'm naked. And what does that mean? Why is that scary? Who told me that was scary? I mean, that's a great just like segue too, just around sexual repression. <laughs> two friends of mine now, um, or two friends of mine who are visiting now and used to live here um, have been recently living in Czech, Czechoslovakia in the winter where it's like super fucking cold. And it's a whole culture built around saunas. <laughs> And get, you know, and it's kind of like extreme temperature therapy. So you get like cool. really hot and then cold plunge, hot, cold plunge, hot, cold plunge. And it is like almost as common, common as coffee shops is that embedded into the culture. And it's a complete clothing optional experience and, and mixed sex. Even the dressing rooms are men and women combined. And so sexuality and that just like appreciation or not even really acknowledge, I mean, probably acknowledgement, but normalized experience of being naked with the other sex doesn't get sexualized. Even naked with yourself. Even naked with the same <laughs> sex, right? I've had that, no, even with yourself. I've oh, had that right. experience where like nakedness, it almost feels taboo. I'm like, dude, I'm in my house. Relax. <laughs> right. And where does that <laughs> program come from? It's like, no, it's your body, dude. <laughs> right. <laughs> Calm it's a down. Wonderful example of like how well, we've got, we've kind of like left the reservation. Yeah. It just comes to like connection with nature, and and the fact that it's all beautiful. Like we have a particular idea of what beauty is supposed to be, and that's changed and evolved over time. Like for a while, you know, the, the women in the tribe that were really like round and yummy were deemed more attractive and. Uh, more um, an example of like being well nourished and well um, like in their their confidence of who they are. Yeah. And now it's almost totally different. I think now we have Ferraris and watches and and those levels of status. Whereas previously, maybe it was more like your status was like, "Bitch, I'm eating." Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like yeah. I'm I'm fed. Yeah, <laughs> just so yeah, you we know. got enough to <laughs> feed the troops here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and so those cultural identifications just change over time. And until we step back long enough to recognize the program and then choose it, and, you know, it's all just different levels of program. Like, we get to choose what program makes the most sense to us. And so if here's the buffet of options, the, the opportunity is to choose consciously. Mm. And 
ultimately I think that's our greatest opportunity for personal liberation in a, in a society that would nominally be um, oriented towards freedom. And we, we talk a lot about democracy and freedom. And in some ways, we're more free globally than we've ever been. I mean, if we look like a historical record. And yet there's still a lot to do and a lot more to go. Yeah, now that you mentioned the HRV, and uh, it's like, it's, it's interesting, ironic, that with the HRV, heart rate variability, it's the chaos that actually denotes health. Right. And that's something that, again, culturally, we're in this place where, where linearity means you're doing a good job. I got the 4.0. I got the, you know, all the stuff that you you seem to have kind of like the dogma that you were seem to have been occupying. Mm -hmm. That means I'm healthy. Mm -hmm. It also might be that you're on the edge of like a nervous breakdown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, <laughs> those fucking shoelaces are pretty tight, man. I'm just like, I'm just holding on. Where's yeah. the finish line? Yeah. Is there, you know, I, I, so I see like dance is a, is a really beautiful way oh. of starting to get exploring that chaos and it, some people if they're really yoga centric or maybe weightlifting centric or whatever it may be more linear practices it'll take a good you know hours or weeks or years maybe to unwind those previous linear dogmas to actually get into a more genuine expression of your own dance mm -hmm. and so people that dance probably get what i'm saying people that don't probably think i'm you know mm -hmm crazy or something but I, I know that you've experienced that I, mm. I would guess just from talking to you absolutely is there any other kind of maybe dance metaphors or maybe dance it's maybe dance the way maybe dance the only way to <laughs> embrace your chaos I, I, I love dance <laughs> yeah and especially when we're dancing you know as the proverb goes or as the saying goes when we're dancing like nobody's watching yeah because there is something about like ecstatic dance and or couples dance like couples dance like flamenco dancing is a particular style and has kind of rules and rhythms so to speak and you're dancing in a particular um, framework because the other is expecting that and the music is is cadenced for that and the movement is um, consistent versus like doing your own solo dance behind a blindfold. <laughs> So even if we're dancing in a group and we're, you know, solo dancing, but we're, re we're socially relating and connecting to another, then we're still kind of like the, the birds of paradise, you know, dancing because it's cool or maybe somebody's checking me out or how's this feeling on the other side of, you know, this potential because, oh, this person's really cool. I like what she's doing. And my lady and I actually, we met that way. Well, we were introduced, but that night when we, when we were on the dance floor and we were like really grooving and seeing each other's dance is when we both locked in like, Oh wow, there's a lot of chemistry here. Yeah. And there's a lot of complementarity to how we're moving in sync. And so there's something f to that for sure. And I'm getting to know us in relationship to this dance. I'm not, as much getting to know directly myself unless I'm watching like, Oh, I'm doing this because it's like, you know, turning her on or, or maybe now she's checking out the other dude. So I got to like edge him out of the way and like get my game on better. You know, there's some kind of like social relatedness behind a blindfold. Dancing with others behind a blindfold is a rad way to drop into a transcendent state in the company of others doing the same without having to become socially referenced and I can stay within my own process and then really surf that beautiful chaos of rhythm and movement because there's such a creative process that flows through that kind of dance. There's such a spontaneous process that flows through that kind of dance. And those two characters are prime examples of the child and bringing us back into the, the child's mind, which is one of, if you leave, if you allow children to be children and not grow up too fast or be in traumatized situations or, um, you know, have like the too, too many early programs that says this isn't the right way to do it. If you just let kids be themselves, they're going to be curious. They're going to be spontaneous. They're going to grow new neural networks that are related to their own constitutional drives and purposes and passions and like what they're skilled at. And it, it, it evolves a very unique and authentic human 
And so when we see traditional cultures or cultures that really allow for that to happen, kids and early adults moving through that kind of developmental arc are more self-assured. Yeah. They have a stronger sense of who they are. There's less depression, anxiety, and all these kind of like neurotic experiences that we have in our culture. Those addiction, depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress, all those are continuously on the rise no matter how much pharmaceuticals we put into the system. And that the dance itself is one of those really beautiful processes that allow us to experience our child through the body versus through our minds or our hearts, which might be more like art, you know, like a creative artistic experience with like painting mandalas or free, you know, writing or drawing or making big abstract things or, you know, rolling around with our brothers and sisters in the mud. Yeah, right. You know, just this, like spontaneous play and how life affirming that is. And there's some of the uh, traditional African cultures that will first address somebody's illness with the question, when did you stop singing and dancing? Yeah. Completely different paradigm than, than the one we're living in, in, in our country right now. And through the benefit of having the opportunity to share information like this on more and more widely networked platforms, we get to help each other remember and mirror and validate the importance of these expressions, the importance of art and dance and spontaneity and play and being sexually realized, free to be our sexual selves attracted to others who are in their sexual self and releasing the dogma that says sex is wrong or this type of sex is wrong or, or even just nudity is bad. That's such a religious dogma. It's something you carry. If you have that, it's with you. Absolutely. Whether it's conscious or not, it's going to continue to run the program. Yeah. So let's talk about it. Let's put it on the table and see if, and see if that is what I actually choose and why I choose that. And at least bring it more into conscious awareness. So it's not to say that my beliefs are the right beliefs. I've done a fair bit of looking at my beliefs and why I believe those things and tried to do my best and continuing to evolve all, all the time about what I believe and why I believe that. And does that lead me into a state of being more happy, joyful, fulfilled, easy, compassionate, inspired, alive? Yeah. Or is it feeling more contracted and fear-based? And like, does it create division or distance? Dance is amazing. Meditation is one of those too that can be very growthful um, and very spontaneous and very creative. Because sometimes when we think of meditation as just like sitting on the cushion and staring at a candle. And it can be that. But can also just be the state of becoming ever more present and aware of what we're doing and experiencing here and now. Yeah. So if I can bring that level of awareness to, you know, reading the prophet or having a cup of tea with a new friend, that can be, this can be an, a meditation in motion. Yeah. And, and to see you when I come up and you're doing these cool, like non-conventional weight training methods, that's bringing a new non-linear expression of physical movement and physical training into the system. We look at traditional cultures. Most traditional cultures were staying fit because they were just using functional movement to keep themselves alive and fit and playing and, and engaged yep. as opposed to needing a, a linear system like yoga my understanding of yoga and I haven't studied yoga tremendously. I've gotten a lot of tremendous benefit from yoga because, um, it helped me rehab a whole lot of injuries that because my, because I have such a passionate play child archetype that comes out in sports, I can p push through injuries yep. that aren't necessarily, um, maybe the, the highest choice for my body, although it feels really good in my spirit. And then some of the rehab programs, that were lengthening were in yoga and through yoga, particularly hot yoga. So if I'm going through a stretching, stretching and lengthening process, but I'm also engaging strength-based conditioning, cardio, um, balance and, and vestibular training, you know, most of those are going to be more spontaneous, like 
all all sports are nonlinear movements. Well, not all, but most. Like I was just watching the downhill and the giant slalom, and it's a fairly linear movement. But you have to have enough flexibility in the system to be able to correct. Otherwise, you're going to wipe out. Until mutations like CrossFit come about. Not yeah. that there's anything wrong with CrossFit, mm-hmm. but it, it becomes like okay, let's dig deep into that linearity. Who can do the line the best? Mm-hmm. You know, and then that's okay. Cool, sweet. I'm I'm a competitor in this linearity, so therefore it's okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I don't yeah. I don't need dance or anything yeah. more expressive. Yeah, I think now that you're talking about it, I never really thought so much about movement practices being like a similar to the complement between yin and yang or masculine and feminine. Mm-hmm. I think they both have their plays. Like linear practices have their yeah, plays. You need Spontaneous it. practices have their plays. It's the frame of the shoe. Don't mm-hmm. take the shoe off. Like mm-hmm. you're going to go out in the snow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. <You know? laughs> Keep the shoe. Yeah. Unless you've done some Wim Hof practices and yeah. you can like stay in that. And that's when you, that's when you kind of run into like the stereotypical kind of like annoying hippie. They took their shoes off. Mm. You know, and then you see the person that's like the uptight, the other side of the spectrum, they're just, their shoot laces are just choking in the mouth. Their yeah. feet are crying. Yeah. You know, it's finding that both sides, yin, yang, linearity, dynamic movement, you know, thought processing, like having, it's, you, you see by, by sitting in place, you actually do better with things like Scantron type tests. You mm-hmm. know, so when you're sitting down and just focusing you do kind of you start to play more in that linear realm but if you want to go more into complex creative outside of the box they call it divergent thinking then all of a sudden you want to move and dance and walk go for a walk all of a sudden that's when your ideas come about Mm. Mm. but sometimes it's good to come back and concentrate Mm -hmm. yeah yeah Yeah, there's something settling that happens with repetitive movement yeah. Yeah. It's a mantra. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we do mantras like audible mantras as physical mantras, audible mantras, mm-hmm. probably smell mantras. Maybe, I don't know, like anchoring yourself in certain smells might be something like that. Yeah, the quickest way to the brain is through the sinus. Mm. So that's why different practices with aromatherapy has become uh, popular and you can see that change neurochemically faster than in, through any other input and more directly through any other input. So the olfactory bulbs sit right underneath the inferior part of the brain. Just under, j- the, the sinuses are separated from the brain by a piece of bone that's the, the thickness of a piece of paper called the cribriform plate. <clears throat> so you get immediate absorption. I mean, you will take in information through the eyes that will adjust and then give off st- signal <clears throat> quicker, but the neurochemical input and ex- expression of that through the olfactory bulbs is um, the most primitive and the earliest defined. So these intranasal therapies is another area that I geek out on is neurocognitive <laughs> restoration or concussion repair. You're a bit of a polymath. <laughs> you seem like you got a lot of there's, depth in various holes. Yeah, there's, there's a few different interests <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and you know that's just an example of um, the things that uh, mirror and engage new friendships, kind of like straight away. Mm. Like, oh, this is another person who's just interested in seeking greater self awareness and greater understanding in the environment of what helps us feel whole, happy, and well. Mm. Whether it's being in the sun, doing non-conventional weight training, or getting your board out and you know, jamming it through some a, a set all morning or, you know, what are the things that make us alive? And those, those that I've come into contact with and made Im- immediate deep connections with have those same kind of virtues and values. Yeah. And oftentimes that's around like geeking out on esoteric shit and trying to figure new stuff out. And one of those new things that we're using more and more intranasal therapies for concussion recovery which makes sense, <clears throat> but the, hasn't been online in the medical mainstream until pretty recent. And so the best way to get things into the brain is actually through the sinuses and not through the blood. <laughs> so if I'm doing something like glutathione, and a lot of people take glutathione because it's a great antioxidant, great anti-inflammatory agent, helps detoxify the liver, what's well, one of the liver detoxification pathways. And if I take it as an IV, then it's going to get chewed up mostly in my heart and my lungs and my liver before it ever gets to my brain. But if I take intranasal glutathione, 
or intranasal stem cells or stem cell growth factors, then it goes preferentially to the brain, and the brain uses it first. And then if I want it both centrally and systemically, then I can do it intranasally and as an IV and get kind of like the best of both. Mm. So yeah, we get into, and it's, smell is a fascinating one. There have been relational studies with couples, uh, essentially like, like pheromone uh, compatibility. The t-shirt study. Right. And if one in the couple doesn't like the other smell, 80% chance the relationship is going to fail. Yeah. It's based off of immune, immuno capa, cap, capa, Compa- How do you say that compatibility. word? Compatibility. Yeah, totally. <laughs> compatibility. Compatibility. Yeah. Which is fascinating <laughs> because like, oh, if you and I come together, then we create something that's stronger because we have this compatibility. Yeah. We want to build something stronger. Yeah. yeah. So our genes can carry on. Yeah. And like seeing this picture of your dad, like you guys are really similar facially, structurally. He's a, he looks like an older but super fit dude. And when we recognize that we are essentially the culmination of like a whole bunch of different possibilities, possibilities in the physical form, emotional form, mental form, soul level form, then no wonder... Because any one of those just by itself is an infinite number of possibilities, physically, emotionally, mentally, soulfully. Mm. When you layer all of those on, then you get this like exponential infinite possibility. So, of course, we're going to be all like unique. And when my unique experience comes into contact with another unique experience and we like start smelling each other, it's so fucking primal, just like dogs do. They start sniffing each other out. Mm. And if both... It, if both do not like the other's smell, or if neither likes the other's smell, then greater than 95% chance that that relationship is going to fail. So it's always made me kind of wonder about like, okay, so what about like arranged marriages where you don't really have a choice? Yeah. Fascinating. They seem to, I've heard that they work kind of well as I've well, heard, actually. I've heard from <laughs> many that they do. <laughs> and, you know, there's something to be said for, like, just making the commitment to making this work. We probably put a lot more pressure in on our relationships than, like, an arranged one. Because there's kind of that, it's almost like that that relief in a sense of, like, oh, we, you know, we, we're, we're friends and we're lovers, but, like, we create this relationship, but it's not the pressure that we put in, in like Western culture where it's like, you're my everything. Right. And now you're my business partner too. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a different, it's a, it takes a know, special relationship to do that. Yeah. Whoa. And, and a lot of my friends, that's the case. It's just, it and seems I've seen like they it work link well. up that way. And I've seen it not work so well, Yeah. you know, because then you, you have to get really clear on where are the boundaries of the, of the particular roles that you're going to play with and for each other. And if we can set up those boundaries, great. And, and each of our roles is identified and expressed and fulfilled, great. And we're having the opportunity to share whatever is not being fulfilled or withheld or um, building as a potential resentment. Like, yes, you're a great partner. We're creating this empire, but you're not fucking me enough. Right. Or, and you know, sometimes that's just getting in, in clear about what the love languages are. Right. So as a, as a, as an intimate partner, do I know what your love language is and vice versa? Am I committed to expressing that and helping to best do what I can to fulfill it? What is your love language? Have you sorted that out? Uh, yeah, it's words of affirmation. Mm. I love just being told I'm awesome. Mm. <laughs> and it's so funny because it's a constitutional issue. There is like a part of the validation that I consistently received in being a peak performer, right. an athlete and student and kind of like crossing both domains. And I, there's also a developmental piece about that because my parents separated when I was really little and um, spent most of the first year in the hospital. So I didn't really trust because I was um, premature and recurrent pneumonia and on a respirator and I didn't have like a lot of constant bonding. So I didn't trust intimacy, (laughs) but I trusted the sense of internal fulfillment that I got when I knew I was doing a quote unquote good job. And I was getting the attention that I was craving later that I didn't get earlier on, particularly from my dad, because I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't grow up in his house and I saw him occasionally. And when I was like captain of the team and getting all A's and 
kicking people's ass on the field and you know when i was doing the thing i would get the kudos and like the verbal kind of recognition and that became like this really sense of fulfillment so i just kept driving for that external validation because kids that's what kids are going to do that's why kids will act negative attention is better than no attention right so they'll act out just to get your attention and ideally they get positive attention um more often than not but also recognizing that they're awesome just for who they are not what they do so it doesn't have to be something that you have to earn in order to get praise or love. And so all this is kind of like a way to unpack that we all have different love languages and those are both constitutional, like how we were born, and they're also developmental, like what the early programs were. How about you? Love language? Uh-huh. Well, uh, touch is definitely, at least I think both giving and receiving love language is a really big one for me. Mm. That's probably the main the main primary focus, mm-hmm. and then from there, I give gifts, receiving gifts. I'm indifferent on. What are the other ones? What are the love, love languages? Time, spending time together, quality time. Yeah. Um. Time. Words of gifts, affirmation. Obviously. Words of affirmation, touch, and um, acts of service. Yeah, acts of service is a big one for me as well. Mm-hmm. Probably touch and acts of service are the most meaningful to me. Mm-hmm. Gifts are gifts are good. I mm-hmm. feel like they're like acts of service to me feels like a layer deeper than a gift. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it certainly totally can be. Yeah, yeah. There's there's some cross there's some overlap between those two. Yeah, and you know each of those is a way to express how much we appreciate the other, and yet we're going to resonate with one of those more directly as a sense of like nourishment and oftentimes we give what we want to receive but it may not be giving what the other is desiring to receive Mm. so if i'm so for example my lady her her primary love language is touch for me i i grew up with an early program and developmental experience that didn't i didn't trust touch because it was inconsistent and when i was feeling bonded there were just oftentimes the experience where now all of a sudden, like as this little infant, now I'm on a respirator and nobody's touching me and like, what the fuck just happened? Yeah. And then sort of come, come kind of in and out of that experience that set up a particular idea around touch. So it's not my default. In fact, it's one of my lesser defaults, but my lady's primary love language is touch. And so it's, it's important for me to recognize that for me to do my part in helping her to feel nourished in the relationship, I do choose to commit to as best I can offering her the primary love language that helps her feel connected to fulfilled, um, and, and, and loved in the particular way that she likes it. And so it's a, it's an act of conscious connection and every thing in relation for me everything in my relationship i desire to have oriented towards the sense of personal growth and fulfillment and so i'm i recognize that that doesn't mean it's going to be easy and i don't think it's supposed to be easy i think i think it's supposed to be fulfilling and fun but i think it, relationships are, are some of the greatest mirrors for showing us our shadow selves and doing shadow level work is not supposed to be easy <laughs> right you know if it was if it was easy we would have would have already done it There was something you mentioned previously in relation to uh, partners and kind of having like that that defensive thing potentially happen, like on the dance floor kind of kind of situation. And I was reading recently about lobsters and they when they're defending their territory, they will end up battling each other. And if the battle gets really bad to the point that you get like, you know, like chop off your claws or chop off your, you know, like like get near death type situation, like, well, I really, they really, you know, I'm definitely mm-hmm. the underdog in this one. It ends up actually changing their chemistry it ends up changing their neurology and that the the chemicals that they pointed out in this thing that i was reading was octopamine and serotonin so serotonin the victor ends up being all juiced up on serotonin mm-hmm. and the def- the the guy that was defeated he ends up being juiced up on this octopamine stuff and then they end up from that point forward, they were kind of at like this even playing ground. And then all of a sudden they go into this split in the road. And now I'm octopamine guy. And then this one's serotonin guy. And serotonin guy becomes 
kind of a dickhead, he picks on everybody, he keeps on kind of juicing himself up with this chemical. Mm, and then like the, a bully. Like a bully. Yeah. And it's just interesting, like the uh it kind of leads into like like learned helplessness mm -hmm. and how we can kind of get stuck in our neurochemistry, you know, but I think the neurochemistry is always associated to everything else. You know, but it's just interesting mm -hmm. how some of these situations just I wanted to mention because I, yeah. I know we're getting we're, we're getting close to having to wrap up and I was like, oh, um, yeah, but starting to first recognize that perhaps you are stuck in some type of we could just focus on the neurochemical kind of sticking point, you know, but I think it's always everything. Mm -hmm. And then from there, how do we start to speak to octopamine guy a little bit and, and start mm -hmm. bringing him back into serotonin mm -hmm. balance? Wonderful question. And I think it's, uh, when I think of the developmental arc, those experiences are early because 85% plus or minus of may of what makes us who we are in our personality is set before we're four or five years old. And that's before we have most of our verbal recall because we haven't connected or myelinated the language center and the verb, the, the memory center. So we in talk therapy don't really get into pre four year old material. And yet that's most of what has solidified our sense of personality. So of course talk therapy is going to be challenging in that regard. And so when I think of the de developmental arc of healing some of that, I think of past, present and future. So we can, like the law of attraction says, we can drive a new sense of who we choose to be. Even if we're octopamine guy, we can drive our neurology towards serotonin guy. And yet, how much of that is its fullest expression if we're still walking around with the program, with the deep subconscious program yeah. that says that that's not true. So we have to be fully in alignment with that statement. And that's what I don't think a whole, maybe it's just what I've read or experienced in the law of attraction. I don't think there's a whole lot discussing that necessity, full alignment to what we're saying and declaring and invoking. And that full alignment means dealing with everything in behind the curtain behind the sub in the subconscious. And for me, consistently, the most safe, effective, and, and efficient way to get to that material is with the medicines <laughs> and ceremony. It's not the only way, by all means. And there are other very effective ways. And I have not explored every avenue possible, for sure. Yeah. I've explored quite a few of them. And, and I've worked in a variety of different capacities as a consultant and clinician and facilitator and, you know, just in different roles and consistently seen some of the most amazing, consistently available awakening experiences with quality facilitated medicine work. And so what the medicines do is they help us clear the backstory. What the law of attraction and accountability piece in the integration does is help us reference and re-reference to a sense of personal responsibility and personal empowerment to choose our new path forward. And what happens in between in the presence is the dance between those and the ability to recognize that there's going to be the tendency to fall back into old patterns. There's going to be the tendency to want to try and move too far ahead of the process and make the process wrong because it's not happening fast enough and in the way I thought it was supposed to and because I don't see the big picture. And so dancing in the middle of that is where we get into our movement practices and our mindfulness-based practices. Stay in the body, to stay as present with the mind, to have a compassion and expression and experience, dancing between who we were and who we are yet to be. And it's like what you were speaking about before in that in-between phase. And that in-between phase is a really rich phase. <laughs> but it's, it's, I think that's where the magic happens because, you know, we're only here in this v present moment. Um, but it's also where the biggest challenges are because we are in between. I think of it kind of like a, the Tibetans speak of um, between lives. The, the space between lives is the bardo. And the bardo is a big unknown, kind of like the chrysalis. We're no longer a caterpillar and not, not yet a butterfly. Oh. And I, I, I think kind of constantly being in the presence of what is happening here and now is 
being in the chrysalis. And the chrysalis essentially eats itself and like dissolves itself inside there. Right. It's, it's this soup of possibility because it's no longer at all a caterpillar and it's no longer at all yet a butterfly. It's this complete amorphous soup of genetic and cosmic potential. And how, how much of that is like the present moment consistently available in this quantum arena of possibility and potential. And how do we choose to orient ourselves towards the futures, the future experiences, feelings, uh, and people that we would most feel fulfilled by. And it's an ongoing process of being more and more okay with the chaos of that soup and more and more clear of who we are, who we are, what we are, how we're here to serve. We're here, we're here, we're here. We are here, we are here. here. (laughs) Amen, brother. We got to wrap this thing up. Yeah, man. How do people uh, learn more about you, find your latest book, find all your stuff? You got all sorts of rad things percolating. Yeah, yeah, a lot of cool things happening. That's one of the things that's leading us to Boulder. We didn't talk about the book at all. We didn't talk about the book at all. (laughs) We got to do part two. (laughs) Part two. I had notes. I had extensive notes of all the shit I wanted to talk about. (laughs) Yeah, we we ended up talking about like all the, the, the stuff I really get a lot of juice from just like the consciousness piece. I think software, consciousness, hardware, neurochemistry, neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, that's the book. So the other area that I geek out on is cognitive restoration out of after concussion or head injury. And so the book is the Concussion Repair Manual um, and the website's at its name, concussionrepairmanual.com. And then Full Spectrum Medicine is on the consciousness piece and bringing the plant-based medicines into... Um, and the, the psychedelic medicines that we know are anchored in, um, healing potential and the clinical trials show that. And the clinical trials for things like psilocybin and MDMA are incredibly good Hmm. and we just need to get out the information. So it's an education advocacy platform called full spectrum medicine at fullspectrummedicine.com. And then my personal practice is, uh, Dr. Dan Engle, Dr. Dan Engle.com, D-R-D-A-N-E-N-G-L-E. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, brother. Pleasure to be on. Appreciate it. Look forward to part two. Super good. Yeah, we got to do that shit. Part two is coming soon. All right, right. recording. We went over. Align Podcast. Thank you guys so much for tuning into that conversation. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Some ways that you can support this podcast, one of which you can pick up an Align Band, which is a heavy duty resistance band, comes along with a door anchor and a carrying case, and a video guide on how to mobilize those joints and integrate that body of yours. Really great stuff. You can be found at aligntherapy.com and also on amazon.com. Um, thank you all so, so much for utilizing the Amazon affiliate link on the right hand sidebar of the podcast page. Bookmark that thing. Anytime you purchase some crap on Amazon, purchase that crap through that link. We get a percentage of it costs you nothing. And I think that's enough. Thank you guys so much for reviews on iTunes. Thank you for listening. Thank you for supporting. Have a beautiful rest of your day. Pow.